second timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 8 the torch of leadership and ministry is passed from paul to timothy this chapter is called the last will and testament of saint paul the great apostle of the gentiles who is now in the maritime prison in rome and is soon to be beheaded in the abbazia del tre fontane by nero's executioners because of his impending death we see in this chapter paul summing up and reiterating certain facts and imparting crucial instructions and exhortations to Timothy this chapter serves as a symbolic mantle passing urging Timothy to carry on the work faithfully with the same unwavering commitment and diligence to the gospel as Paul since Paul knew that he is passing from the scene and Timothy must carry the mantle Paul uses a strong language to command and encourage Timothy to continue the work of the gospel even in challenging circumstances paul unloads nine imperatives with mission gun precision on the different aspects of the ministry we see paul sharing every last bit of his wisdom with timothy before he attains his eschatological goal of entering the heavenly kingdom faithful stewardship to god's word verses 1 to 5 a solemn charge to timothy verse 1 in the presence of god and of christ jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom i give you this charge paul begins with a solemn charge the greek word for giving charge is dia martiromai a legal word which means testify under oath in the court of law or to adjure a witness to testify he is not merely advising or suggesting he is commanding timothy with great seriousness and intensity by invoking the two divine witnesses god and christ jesus the judge who is returning to this solemn charge paul is making the charge more important paul emphasizes the weight of this charge and the seriousness of timothy's testimony by also reminding him of the ultimate eternal eternal judgment to be faced by all men both the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom here paul refers to two significant events one his appearing epiphany this points to the return of christ timothy must live in anticipation of christ's second coming to his kingdom paul reminds timothy that christ's kingdom will be established as a faithful servant timothy's actions matter in light of this future reality and he must be prepared for this momentous event everyone who ministers the word of god is under the omniscient scrutiny of christ this verse underscores the gravity of christian ministry the unique accountability of the believers and the eternal consequences of our actions it's a call to faithfulness courage and unwavering commitment to the gospel message the charge preach the word verse 2 preach the word be instant in season out of season correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction here comes the weighty charge which carry the divine authority the charge to timothy is to faithfully preach the word of god and remain steadfast in proclaiming god's word regardless of circumstances preaching is a god ordained means to prevent deflection from the truth we have five out of the nine imperatives here about the essential aspects of the ministry preach be prepared correct rebuke and encourage george howard gatri an american biblical scholar writes to rebuke without instruction is to leave the root cause of the error untouched timothy has to follow the multifaceted balanced approach of rebuking correcting and encouraging to continuously monitor so that the people do not turn from the sound doctrine or to myths the usage of these verbs suggest urgency preparedness faithfulness commitment and readiness while communicating god's revealed truth all of this should be done with great patience and careful instruction to make sure the preaching is grounded in sound doctrine ministry is not limited to convenient moments whether the circumstances are in season that is favorable or out of season that is challenging a minister must be diligent and ready to share the gospel and must be available he must slip no opportunity whether the fruit is evident or the fruit seems invisible the word of god has to be preached. 
reached which requires constant readiness as elgin g white an american author and co-founder of the seventh day adventist church said do not ask yourself if this is a suitable occasion for preaching but ask rather why this should not be a suitable occasion have no limited season let it always be thy season four traits of people who will turn away from the true preaching of god's word verses 3 4 verse 3 for a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear paul warns timothy about a future time when people will have the below four traits the first trait men will reject and refuse to accept sound doctrine that is the word of god and look for alternatives second trait they will seek out for teachers to tell them what they want to hear and who would provide interpretations that appeal to their personal preferences even if it means departing from the core truths of the gospel the years of selective listeners metaphorically itch for something new so they seek for novelty to scratch their reaching ears they have an endless curiosity to gratify their desires and will surround themselves with instructors who will offer them god's blessings teach them novel doctrines tantalizing theories new philosophies stimulating rhetoric and flowery phrases rather than the word of forgiveness and repentance which is able to make them wise unto salvation teachers who appeal to itching ears tell people what they want to hear not what they need to hear this serves as a cautionary reminder for teachers and listeners alike when a preacher is scratching itching ears beware as believers we must be vigilant discerning and committed to the truth regardless of prevailing trends or personal preferences verse 4 they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths third trait these individuals instead of embracing sound teaching of the gospel will deliberately avoid listening to the truth and intentionally close their ears to sound doctrine gilbert keith chesterton an english writer philosopher and christian critic says when a man rejects god's truth it isn't that he believes in nothing he will believe anything no matter how senseless it might be since such a man has opened himself to a wide variety of beliefs he will embrace anything that comes along fourth trait these unfaithful people will stumble through false ideas and myths paul had already warned timothy about false teachers who propagated myths 1 Timothy 1:4 and now he reiterates that caution here rather than seeking the truth they will gravitate toward more appealing fables and myths that oppose sound doctrine this is a cautionary reminder to remain steadfast in sound doctrine diligently seek god's word and guard against turning away from it even when it clashes with worldly desires and popular trends the testimony restated fulfill your ministry verse 5 but you this is a word of contrast against the people mentioned in the previous two verses paul here adds the last four imperatives to the nine about the most essential aspects of the ministry six keep your head in all situations that is be alert maintain mental clarity and spiritual focus seven endure hardship eight do the work of the evangelist the greek term euangelistes refers to someone who presents the good news of christ and shares the message of salvation with others this is not an easy task that's why paul calls it work because it extends beyond personal comfort and convenience 9 discharge all the duties of your ministry this divine assignment was a great trust that was reposed in timothy and therefore he must be loyal to all its obligations and perform all the duties of his office with diligence care fidelity and devotion paul's instructions to timothy emphasize focus endurance evangelism and faithful ministry the final words from paul his triumphant confidence verses 6 to 8 as paul near the end of his life he is able to look back without regret or remorse in these verses he examines his life from three perspectives the present reality of the end of his life for which he was ready verse 6 the past when he had been faithful verse 7 and the future as he anticipated his heavenly reward verse 8 
Paul's present reality. Verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. Paul recognized that his earthly race was run. Adam Clark, a British Methodist theologian and a biblical scholar, says, Paul could not have spoken thus positively had not the sentence of death been already passed upon him. Paul felt that he was in the airport and his flight to heaven was ready to depart. He waits for his boarding call. Paul provides a poignant reflection of his impending martyrdom. He uses a sacrificial metaphor to describe his situation. Among the Jews, a drink offering of wine is the final offering that followed the burnt and grain offerings prescribed for the people of Israel. It is poured out beside the altar following the offering of a ram, lamb or bull in the temple. Paul saw his coming death as his final drink offering to God in a life that had already been full of sacrifices to God. Drink offerings are called libations which serve as a symbolic offering to honor and please divine beings. William Hendrickson, a New Testament scholar, writer and biblical commentator says, just as the libations poured out in the Jewish sacrifices was the final crowning ceremony involved in the offering of the sacrifice, Paul considered his coming death as the final event that would embellish and complete the marvelous life of suffering for the gospel which he had already lived. There is also a Roman idea here. Every Roman meal ended with the pouring out of the cup of wine before the gods as a small sacrificial ritual to the gods. The wine is completely emptied from the cup and totally given to God. In the Roman sense, it is like Paul saying, the day is done, the meal is just about to be over and I am being poured out unto God. His head was not on the executioner's block yet, but his heart was there. He was ready to make the ultimate sacrifice. He considered himself as on the eve of being sacrificed and looks upon his blood as a drink offering which is poured out after the other offerings. Paul's death is now close at hand and the time has come for his departure. The Greek word for departure is analysios which conveys the image of raising the ship's anchor and loosening the cables from the dock for the ship to set sail on its destined voyage. The word departure that Paul used has an idea of success in it. To him, death would make him free from this life and be a way to a better life. Death is not an end but a transition, a departure from this earthly life to the eternal realm. Paul's past faithfulness, verse 7. Paul isn't bragging at the end of his life. His words reflect his confidence in his ministry, his perseverance and his unwavering commitment to the Christian faith. The form of the three Greek words, good fight, agona, have finished, tetelika and have kept, tetereka indicates completed action with continuing results. Throughout his ministry, Paul used the picture of a race and a Christian being an athlete running that race. In this contest, Paul fought the good fight and triumphed over every obstacle that stood between him and the crown of life. Now he knew his race is just about to be finished. Despite trials, temptations and adversities, Paul remained steadfast in his belief in Christ Jesus and guarded and preserved the Christian faith. Paul's future anticipating a heavenly reward. Christian race allows that all who lawfully and diligently complete the race would receive the prize. Paul gives a glimpse of the heavenly reward awaiting him and all the faithful believers. Verse 8 Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now there is means that the next thing, once you faithfully follow the essential aspects of the ministry, is to be ready to receive the crown. Notice that Paul would not claim that he was righteous by himself. The good news is that Jesus is the righteous judge who gives a crown of righteousness to all who trust him and long for his appearing. It's not a physical crown but a heavenly recognition for a life lived faithfully. Paul envisioned an award ceremony and he anticipates receiving this 
this crown from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was about to be condemned and executed by an earthly judge. But he is confident of being rewarded by a heavenly righteous judge on that day of judgment at the appearing of Christ, that is, at the second advent of our Lord. The crown of righteousness is not exclusive to Paul. The righteous judge will give to all who love, prepare and long for his appearing. It's a promise of eternal glory for those who anticipate his return. Conclusion These eight verses encourage us to remain faithful, long for Christ's appearing and look forward to the heavenly crown of righteousness. May we all heed Paul's exhortations to boldly proclaim the truth, run our race well and eagerly anticipate the glorious appearing of our Lord to receive our crown. Amen.